and identifications and um, locations on iNaturalist, the app. So that'd be a good way for you to get an idea where to go look. Lost your audio. Sorry, I can only kind of hear you, Lizzie. Getting a lot of wind. We can we can definitely hear you. It's just distant. Been unmuted. That sounds good. Oh, I don't know. Can you guys see my PowerPoint? It looks normal. It doesn't look weird. I can. I can, I can see your PowerPoint. Great. That sounds good then. I can see you. Cool. I can hear you, but I can't hear the other person. That's okay. She can just yell. <laughs> um, okay, how many people do we have? Should I get started? I'll start slow and we'll see how it goes. All right, so I am Bethany Tigan. Um, I founded the Philadelphia Mycology Club in, uh, let's see, May of 2018, and um, we've been doing good. We have about 1,500 people now, so it's becoming a relatively big club, um, and I am just really, really into teaching other people about mushrooms because I love to hunt mushrooms, and I like to talk about mushrooms, and in order for me to do that, I need other people to do it with me and mushrooms have made me really happy, so I like to tell other people about them, and in case it makes them real happy, basically. So we're gonna start out with some quick facts. Um, the number one thing is that fungi are not plants. A lot of people have this idea that fungi are weird plants. They're certainly not plants whatsoever. Um, they're technically more closely related to animals than plants, which is absolutely not to say that they are animals, but just to give you an idea, of how not plants they are. Um, they cannot photosynthesize the way that plants do, so they cannot create their own food from sunlight. Um, they are heterotrophic, which just means that they basically need to eat something else in order to survive. Um, some of them, just a fun fact, can glow in the dark or they can fluoresce under UV light. That's actually a lot more common than you would think. Um, sometimes if you go out at night in like the forest or the jungle, you can actually find um, at least some some mycelium bits glowing and things like that. Um, but there are quite a few glowing mushrooms. There are some that glow here in Philadelphia that you can find. Um, and that you can see them with your naked eye when it's, when it's really dark out. Um, fungal species typically outnumber plants in any given location six to one. So what exactly does that mean? That means that if you're in the forest, um, and you see all these different trees and plants and things around you, you can assume that there are six times as many species of fungi around you right now. You just might not be able to see them, um, and we'll talk about why that is in a second. Um, the largest living organism in the planet is a mushroom called, or a fungus, I should say, called Armillaria ostoyae, and it covers 2,000 acres. Um, and you might be thinking, there's a mushroom that's 2,000 acres? No, that is not the case. So we have to talk about what the difference is between a fungus and a mushroom, because the mushrooms are pretty normal size for Armillaria ostoyae, but the fungus itself is very large. So a mushroom is only part of a fungus. Um, the mushroom is only the fruiting structure that's made in order to divert, di disperse spores from the fungus after it has gone through sexual reproduction. 
So a fungus itself is basically this, uh, what you're seeing here is fungus. This is called mycelium, which is just a network of tiny threads, kind of looks like a cobweb. Some people think of them as roots. Um, they're not roots in that they are the entire structure. The entire structure is just these tendrils. Um, and when it's ready to disperse spores, it creates a mushroom and only then. So um, a common analogy that a lot of people use when they're talking about mushrooms and picking mushrooms is like apples on an apple tree. So an apple tree does not always have mushrooms on it, but when it's ready to disperse its seeds, it will create fruits on the tree and you could pick those fruits without hurting the tree. So this is why mushroom hunting is seen as a lot more sustainable than some sorts, some types of uh, plant foraging. Because for instance, if you go to a place where ramps are growing and you go and pick all of the ramps, um, then feasibly the ramps might not come back next year because you've taken the entire organism out of its ecosystem and left none of it behind. But with mushrooms, if you go out and you see a whole bunch of, say, morel mushrooms, and you pick every single morel mushroom, um, most of those mushrooms have already released thousands and thousands of spores by the time you've picked them. And even if they haven't, all of the fungus is still underground, still just as happy as it was before, and still probably going to produce more fruit later. Um, so plants have a... Or <laughs> Fungi have a few different ecological roles um, in the forest, and they're not all completely uh, defined that well, really. Um, so some are maybe somewhere between saprotrophic and parasitic, but in general, we're gonna talk about three different types of fungi, and that's saprotrophic fungi, parasitic fungi, and mycorrhizal fungi. So the saprotrophic fungi are the ones that decompose plant matter for the world, basically. So in the forest, say a tree falls over, um, and that tree needs to become something that can feed other things again. Uh, and the mycelium of a certain fungus will get in there, will start digesting it, and will eventually produce fruits um, in order to spread its spores out again. So a lot of the decomposing that's done in forests and jungles and things like that, anywhere really, um, even in your house plant, a lot of that will be done by fungi. Um, parasitic fungi are actually a type that will attack a living host and often kill it. Sometimes it won't kill it. Sometimes you'll have maybe a plant that has a parasitic fungi that will live inside of it for a very, very long time that hurts it, but not enough to kill it. Um, this type of fungus here that we're looking at is in the family Cordyceps. A lot of people have heard of these. They're pretty cool. They parasitize um, different insects and actually kind of take over their brain in sort of a, a zombie-esque way and convince them to hike up trees and things to a nice lofty location and then they shoot a mushroom out of their body. So kind of messed up, but very cool. Um, mycorrhizal fungi form a symbiotic relationship with plants, mostly trees. Um, so what they actually do is they live in the soil and they wrap their mycelium around the roots of large mature trees that they have over millions of years formed these relationships with. And they will help that tree soak up as much water and nutrients as it needs in order or in exchange for the tree photosynthesizing and producing sugars and giving those sugars to the fungi. Um, and Something around 80 to 90, some people say 100% of trees need a mycorrhizal relationship in order to grow very large after a certain age. So any really mature tree that you see growing big and tall is going to have mycorrhizal partners. Some of them will not always produce uh, mushrooms that we can see, but all large old trees can only become that size and that strength because they have mycelium helping them get as much water as they would need because their roots cannot get as fine and as filamentous as the mycelium can, so they can't soak up as much water. Um, so when I talked about blurring the lines uh, between the two of them, or between these three things, um, 
one example would be the honey mushroom that we talked about earlier, that our malaria mushroom. All of the species in the honey mushroom genus um, could be seen as both parasitic or saprotrophic because they will attack and kill a living tree, but then they will stay on that dead tree for years and years to come decomposing it. So there's a lot of, um, there's not a lot of defined, defined roles necessarily. And there's still a lot that scientists need to un uncover about the relationship of mushrooms in, in our ecosystems, for sure. So we're gonna talk about some of the basic morphological terms. Um, these are not all of the terms, but these are the main ones that you're gonna need. Um, mushrooms produce their spores on a surface called the hymenium. So this is basically just where the spores come from on any particular mushroom. And it's a very important part of any particular mushroom. So if you find a mushroom and you take a picture of it just like this, and you just take a picture from the top and we can't see the bottom, we're probably not gonna be able to tell you what it is because the main important part for identification of the mushroom is the hymenium. And um, much like I was saying before, the, uh, the differences between pores and gills and teeth and things like that can become a little bit blurred just because evolution over time has, um, has created you know, some pores that changed into gills over millions of years. So sometimes you'll find elongated pores that might be called gills and things of that nature. Um, but in general, when we talk about a mushroom that has a cap and a, and a stalk, we are talking about either pores, gills, or teeth that these mushrooms are going to have under their cap. So in this case, this is a type of amanita. So this has gills here. Um, these are the, uh, the more scientific terms, but a lot of them are a bit pretentious. For instance, nobody says lamellae. You can just say gills. There's never a need to say lamellae. You can just say gills. Um, but some of them are more useful. Uh, for instance, vulva, spelled with an O. Um, this is something that is featured on a lot of the, all of the Amanita mushrooms and a few other species uh, and genus of mushroom have something called a vulva, which um, is part of what we call the universal veil. So some mushrooms are formed inside of a little sac and these mushrooms start forming and then burst out of that sac. So especially all the ones in the family Amanita, like the Amanita muscaria, the fly agaric that a lot of people know of. Um, those ones will have remnants of that universal veil here, and that's an important identifying characteristic for them. You can even see some of the remnants of the universal veil right here on the top of the cap. Yeah. And um, here we have part of the partial veil. These remnants are left over from a veil that covers the gills or the general uh, hymenium before the spores are ready to be released. So this just kind of keeps them safe and protects them and once the mature or once the mushroom is mature enough it will break away and into this annulus or ring as we call it um, and that is a very important identifying characteristic. So uh, a lot of mushrooms don't have all of these parts on them. There are lots of mushrooms that don't have an annulus. There are lots of mushrooms that don't have a vulva. There are lots of mushrooms that don't have a stem. Um, but these are the, the words that you might need to know when you encounter the mushrooms that do have those things. But we will talk about lots of different morphologies of mushrooms right now. Um, so while a lot of people think of like a cap and a stalk as what a mushroom is, a mushroom, like we said before, is any fruiting structure made by a fungus. So there are lots of things that can be called a, mu a mushroom and they do not all have a cap and a stem. Um, and these are some of the form groups. So these form groups are not necessarily um, monophyletic, which means that a lot of them have um, evolved separately. They don't all, not everything in the puffball group is related to everything else in the puffball group, for instance, but these are some forms that mushrooms have taken over time that are some of the ways that they've decided they wanna release their spores. So in the crust fungi here, um, the spores or the hymenium would just be right here on this crust. They simply mature their spores right here and they waft away. Um, in the stinkhorn fungus, yeah, it looks really silly. The genus of this is Phallus, so that's a fun fact. Um, the spores in this case, interestingly enough, 
um, mature right here in a gelatinous gloop. And then they're called stinkhorns because they smell very bad and flies and other insects will come and walk all over them and then carry their spores elsewhere because they smell like rotting flesh. So of course it was a little bit of really fun mycological shade that somebody took this stinky dead fungus and called it phallus. Um, so the bird's nest fungi, these are really cool. You can actually see these all over Philadelphia in the, um, in the mulch. I saw these years ago before I ever knew anything about mushrooms and I was like, what the heck is that? And then I forgot about it. Um, they're not at all bird's nests, obviously. They are, um, some people call them splash cups and I think that's a good name for it, but I think that's confusing with cups down here. So what these do um, is they form packets of spores. So each of these little things that look like seeds or eggs are actually a packet of spores. And when rain comes and drops into these little cups, it will splash those packets out into neighboring areas and slowly but surely they will spread over time. Um, coral fungi and generally anything in like the club fungi uh, realms. They are similar to the crust where they basically are just growing their spores here on on the edges of these fertile surfaces. Puffballs actually mature their spores inside of these balls and then slowly form a hole in order to waft those out. I'm sure we've all run into them. It's real fun to uh, flick them and watch them spore out dust into the air. It's real nice. Um, and then cup fungi are pretty self-explanatory, they're little cups. Um, a fun fact is that morels are actually cup fungi, which is uh, weird to think about because they are, you know, more of a, a cliche mushroom shape, but all of the top of the mushroom is actually just an amalgamation of tiny cups that are all releasing their spores in a cup fungi sort of fashion. So that's sort of a um, interesting fact. Um, and the cordyceps that we talked about earlier would be another, another uh, method of spore dispersal similar to the corals or things like that. That's another form group that we could talk about. Um, I'm gonna do a little sidestep into lichens. Um, lichen are absolutely fungi, but they have formed a symbiotic relationship with algae and cyanobacteria over millions of years because they didn't want to eat anything anymore. They'd rather just sit there and make their own food. So basically they can photosynthesize now because they made this little partnership inside their bodies. Um, and they're not ephemeral like mushrooms are. They stay there all year round because of the fact that they uh, are photosynthesizing. They can just sit there um, and they don't decay away and grow back every few weeks or years. Um, Often the people who study lichen are actually completely different than the people who study fungi, and often the people who study fungi don't know anything about lichen, or vice versa. That is true for me. I don't know anything about lichen, <laughs> but I know they're really cool. Um, and if you want to look into something really crazy, try and look into uh, the way that lichen mate, because that is wild, because they have to first get the algae to mate, and then the fungi have to mate, and then they all have to mate. It's a whole thing. Very few people know about lichens. It's really interesting. Um, and slime molds is another thing I want to talk about real quick. Slime molds are not fungi at all. They are protists. They are in the kingdom protista. However, they are heterotrophic and they reproduce by dispersing spores. And they are often found in all of the same places where people find mushrooms. So, um, a lot of people who are mycologists tend to study slime molds anyway just because they, they seem to really scratch all the same itches for us in, the, in that they're quite ephemeral, they're really weird, they're colorful, they're interesting. Um, so they're not fungi, but uh, it's something you might, you might run into while mushroom hunting and there's a lot of cool stuff to learn about that too. Slime molds are definitely something to look into. There's some, some cool documentaries and videos about them. So we're going to talk about how to hunt mushrooms. This is a cute little picture of our mushroom club one day. You can see we found a chicken of the woods right here. That was quite big. This is Lula. She's a good girl. Um, so mushrooms can be found in a lot more places than you think that they can. Um, I often get caught 
climbing in bushes in Center City. And people are like, what are you doing? And I'm like, oh, I'm looking for mushrooms. And they always are like, there are no mushrooms there. And I was like, then what is this mushroom that's right here? So you can find them in a lot more places than you think. Often just like in your backyard, in the grass, in some potted plants, you can find mushrooms. I bet anybody who has a lot of plants has seen the little yellow, the little yellow mushroom that pops up in your plants. It's called Leuco caprinus birnbaumii. It's a really common one. Um, mushrooms need rain and moisture to grow. Mushrooms are made mostly of water, so they need a lot of moisture in order to grow. So it depends on the mushroom, but in general, you want to wait until one, two, three, or four days after rain and then go out looking for them. But if it's been really dry for a while, you're going to have a hard time finding them. Um, so mature trees, like we said before, those mature trees have often formed the relationships that we're looking for with the, the mycorrhizal mushrooms and uh, decaying wood because that's where a lot of the, the saprotrophic mushrooms are going to be found. So because of that, it's important to actually, if you want to get really into mushroom hunting, to learn some of your basic trees. Um, it'll help you a lot with your mushroom hunting. There are certain trees that are really well known for forming a lot of those mycorrhizal relationships and certain trees barely ever form them. So for instance, oak or pine or spruce or things of that nature, those, those trees are really good for looking for mushrooms. Whereas if you're in a forest full of, you know, sycamore, you're not really gonna find a lot of mushrooms. Um, useful items for mushroom hunting. A lot of people ask me what you need. Um, you don't need a lot. All I really bring is my camera and some kind of a container. I like these little tackle boxes just because I find a lot of small things and I don't want them to get hurt or uh, smushed before I get home. But if you're just into foraging, you can just use a big basket or even a paper bag. It's much easier to carry around in your backpack and not have to worry about whether or not you brought your box with you today. Um, and a knife is good to have. It's not super necessary. None of these mushrooms are usually very hard. Um, when I went mushroom hunting in Ecuador, I actually brought a plastic knife with me so that I could take it on the plane and back, and that worked great. <laughs> so, um, when I say appropriate hiking attire and gear, what I mean by that is that I have personally found that the number one most dangerous thing about mushroom hunting is poison ivy and ticks. So, <laughs> I currently have poison ivy on my hands. I always do. I, it's getting worse as, as I get it more often, but you know, that's fine. So just be aware of that. Make sure you wear bug spray and uh, maybe long pants if you're a little worried about that. Um, we're gonna talk about how to record your mushroom so you can get a good ID for it. Um, because a lot of times you don't have somebody with you to tell you what it is. You need to send somebody some pictures and if you just send them one quick picture of the top of the mushroom, they're probably not going to know what it is. But if you send them a bunch of pictures, you can always, always, always find the name of your mushroom. So one of the first things you want to do is think about where you are. So we talked about um, different, different mushrooms like different wooded areas. You want to know if you're going to be in a hardwood area or a coniferous area or something like that. Um, the date is very important. So earlier, um, our friend mentioned the hen of the woods mushroom. If you wanted to find hen of the woods mushroom and you went out in May, you're going to have a really hard time because they don't grow in May. They grow in the fall. Um, so a lot of times when you find a mushroom and you want to know what it is, just knowing what time of year it is, is going to be really helpful uh, just because you can rule out a whole lot of stuff that isn't growing in the early spring. So if I find a mushroom right now, there's really only maybe 15 mushrooms that I've been seeing regularly and I could go and look at what one of those are and get a better idea as compared to looking at everything that grows for the whole year. So that can be a helpful way to um, narrow down your search. Um, taking a lot of pictures of the mushroom is very important. You wanna take a picture of it before you pick it so that you can remember what it was growing from. I don't know how many times I'll ask somebody, what was this growing from? And they go, oh, I don't know. I'm like, well, I don't know what it is then. <laughs> um, Often the base of the mushroom, especially on the Amanita mushrooms, like we were talking about before, uh, have important identifying characteristics. So this is one type of Amanita that you can see has this bulb here. And there's one down here that um, 
can see all this cool stuff on the face. And all of that was a little bit buried. So if I had just snapped it and said to somebody, what is this mushroom? They wouldn't have had the most obvious identifying characteristic of it. Um, so when we talk about pulling out the base of the mushroom, a lot of people get antsy about that. And they say that you need to cut the mushroom so that you don't pull out the roots of the mushroom. But as we all now know, mushrooms do not have roots. That's not a thing. Um, and luckily, some very nice people in Sweden did a 20, uh, not Sweden, I'm sorry, Switzerland, did a 20 year study where they did a bunch of, um, they studied some forested areas over the span of 20 years and studied the impact of mushroom picking, whether, um, whether the mushrooms came back as fully in an area where they weren't picked or where they were picked or where they were cut or where they were pulled out of the ground. Um, and they came to the conclusion that it did not make a difference. So um, try not to tell anybody that they're not allowed to pull the base of their mushroom out of the ground because it's very important for identification. <laughs> Um, of course, including a clear picture of the hymenium is very, very important, like we talked about. Um, and then some of them stain. So this one, I just took uh, a stick and I drew a little smiley face on it just to show that it stained. Um, and some of them, if you cut them in half like this, you can see that the, the flesh will change colors. Not always this much. Um, sometimes this part will change color and this part won't, and that's a interesting characteristics. So really the more that you can tell us about it, the better, the better chance you are of getting an identification. And spore color is also very important. Um, I'm sure some of you who have delved into this a little bit have heard about making spore prints, where you basically, it's really simple, you just cut off the cap of the mushroom and you put it gill side or hymenium side down on a piece of um, aluminum foil or just paper you have laying around if that's easier. Um, I like to use aluminum foil because spores are never silver. Um, and that way you can look at the color of the spores, but often that's not necessary. Often, if you have a few mushrooms, you can find out the color of the spores right there without doing anything. So in this instance, two of the mushrooms were overlapping and you can see that a spore print was already created right here. Um, and on this mushroom is the cortinarius, and it has a little bit left of this partial veil right here where its spores dropped and got caught on that. So this little, these spores here are an indication that this has uh, these orangish rusty colored spores, brown color. Um, so you can totally make spore prints. It's fun. It's really cute. People like to make them. But a lot of the times people will tell you, oh, why do you need to make a spore print? You can see it right here. And as you, as you look at them more, you can get an idea of what the spore color is without making them, but it never hurts to make one and it's fun. And then you can send your spores to your friends if you want. I don't know. Um, a few other things that you might want to know, this is just some random things I think you should know. Um, you can touch any mushroom. Any mushroom is able to be touched. You don't need to put your gloves on. You don't need to wash your hands after. It's 2020, so you should wash your hands after, but in general, you don't need to do that. Um, people get worried about touching a poisonous mushroom, and then they're like, I rubbed my face, am I going to die? No, you have to actually take a bite out of a mushroom that is poisonous in order for it to hurt you at all. Um, you can touch any mushroom. Uh, and in that sense, mushroom hunting is actually... Uh, <laughs> A lot of mycologists will argue that mushroom hunting is much safer than plant hunting because technically you could take any mushroom, no matter how poisonous it is, put it in your mouth, chew it up, spit it out, just to get the taste of it for identifying reasons. Um, and that mushroom would not hurt you as long as you spit it out. Now imagine taking poison ivy and putting it in your mouth and chewing it up and spitting it out, you would not be having a good time. So technically, as long as you're able to not swallow anything that you cannot identify, mushroom hunting is absolutely safe. Um, state parks or city parks often have laws about foraging. So that's something you need to think about before you go foraging. Um, in Philadelphia and the surrounding regions, I've never had a problem with this, so I wouldn't worry about it if you're uh, in the areas of PA surrounding us. If you're going to New Jersey, I would, I would think about it. They definitely are a little more antsy about what people are doing in their parks, especially in the Pine Barrens, which makes sense as it's a very, um, they're trying to protect it from, from being 
all ripped apart because it's you know small and endangered. Um, so make sure that you know if you're allowed to be collecting things where you're collecting things. Um, common names. A lot of people talk to me about common names and things. They say they have a problem with the scientific names. That's so understandable. The problem is that there are way, way more species of mushrooms than there are of most other things. For instance, I think that the species of birds in America is maybe like 700 in North America. Um, the species of mushrooms in North America is like, I don't know, I think there's um, something like one to five million species of mushrooms are thought to exist in the world. Uh, I believe there's 120,000 species of mushrooms currently that are named and known. So um, we don't have common names for them all, mainly because nobody cares about mushrooms. That's the problem. It's, <laughs> it's, it's a true fact. So if you really just want to learn, you know, the big edible mushrooms in the woods, you can totally use common names. Those are the ones that people care about. And we all use the common names for chicken of the woods. I'm not going to call it Lytoporus sulfurious and I can say chicken. Everybody knows what I'm talking about. But, you know, if you want to find it, a lot of people ask me the common name for a mushroom that is just silly, the idea that it would have a common name because um, mycologists love our scientific names. They're much more uh, organized and specific. Um, and if it's a mushroom that only mycologists talk about, it certainly will not have a common name. <laughs> so just so you know, if you're getting into plants or bugs or trees, a lot of the times common names work just fine. But with mushrooms, you're going to have a lot more pushback on that just because there aren't common names for a lot of it. Um, and eating mushrooms. Just in general, um, it's a good idea to cook all of your mushrooms. There are some mushrooms that can be eaten raw, but it just in general, uh, it will always make you less likely to have any upset stomach or anything if you cook them. Um, and just like you would with any food that you've never eaten before, if it's your first time eating any species of mushroom, you should eat just a little bit, just because you don't know if you're allergic to this thing or not because you've never tried it before. So a lot of the times people will try a mushroom and they think that they've eaten the wrong mushroom or they've been poisoned. And really what happened is they just ate a whole lot of a mushroom that they didn't know that their stomach didn't like. Um, there, for instance, the honey mushroom, like we talked about before, that's one that um, some people just can't eat that one. It just makes them sick. So everybody reminds people, if you're gonna eat that one, just try a little and make sure that your stomach can handle it. Just like some people are allergic to nuts or you know, whatever. Um, so we're going to talk about some resources. I hope that we all know what iNaturalist is. It's a super cool app and website. It has both a website and an app. Um, it is really great for putting things that you find on the internet and how, having, having other people tell you what they are, basically. Um, it also saves everything that you've found before. So when I'm trying to remember a name of something that I saw three months ago and I don't remember the name of it or exactly where I saw it. I can go back and look at that. Um, but more so than that, it is a resource for community science or as some people call it citizen science. I prefer the term community science because it's very hippie and nice. Um, basically the idea of that is that if I find a mushroom and I put that mushroom on Facebook for everybody to see it, that's cool and they can all see it and that's great. But then later, Nobody can go and search on Facebook to say, where has somebody seen a morel in the past three weeks? Facebook doesn't have any kind of search like that, whereas iNaturalist does have a search like that. And if I happen to be a scientist who is studying morels, I can then go on iNaturalist and get all of this data that is put together by millions of people about um, about all these different types of fungi. And you can imagine how useful that is to scientists. Uh, because you know how many scientists are actually being paid to do mycology? Like four of them. Like if you know a mycologist, they're not being paid to do mycology. They're just not. We just do it because we're obsessive. Um, so the few people who do study these things, they can't go out and, and identify all these mushrooms. They can't go out and observe them all and figure out their distribution and their, you know, and their spread. So they need us to do things like that. And the more that we do things like that, the more we know about our habitat, what's disappearing, what type of ecological roles are happening, um, what we need to be protecting, how we need to be protecting it. Um, so 
I got into mushroom hunting years ago, but it took me another year or so to realize that all this time that I'm spending observing and identifying all these things could be actually put to use for the greater good of science just by uploading them to iNaturalist or uh, like we'll talk about in a second, Mushroom Observer, rather than just putting them on my own Facebook, which I also do. Um, so here you can look at the Philadelphia Mycology Club page for iNaturalist. Um, if you upload anything to iNaturalist in Philadelphia, it will automatically be sent to this group um, because it simply groups all of that together for us. You don't need to be part of the group. You just need to be on iNaturalist and have your location turned on. So as you can see, um, I started this two years ago and since then we've gotten 380 different species of just fungus in Philadelphia and the surrounding counties, which is quite good, I think. Um, there's some really cool ones. This one is just a tiny, tiny, tiny little mushroom that grows on the back of a ladybug, which I thought, I've never seen that. I've never heard of that, but this entomologist found it and because it's a fungus and because he put it on iNaturalist, it's now in the Philadelphia Mycology Club. I thought that was amazing. So here you can see a morel that somebody put up um, with their location. So you get an idea of where to look for these things. Um, and here's a mushroom that I found just a few days ago and then I stuck it into iNaturalist just to show you what it would look like when you go to upload a mushroom. So when you're on the main page for iNaturalist, there's a little, um, a little camera button and you press the camera and it will either let you take a picture or upload a picture that you've already taken. Um, and it will automatically put all of this here for you because your smartphone has, you know, the information. Um, and you just click, what did you see? If you know what it is, you can just type in what it is. But if you don't know what it is, it will give you some ideas. And it will also give you an idea of how sure it is. So if it says we're pretty sure, you can, you can be pretty certain that um, it is in this. And then it will give you some more suggestions for what it might be. And then you can just click these little info dots and it will give you more pictures and more identifying characteristics about these things. So for this particular instance, I put this one picture in here and the first species that it told me it was is the actual correct species. So that's pretty cool. Um, it's not always correct, definitely not, but it usually has the correct answer in the options, at least the correct genus. Um, and then once you upload those things to iNaturalist, other people in our area who are way smarter than me or you can come and tell you what it is if you were wrong or give you some ideas on what you need to look for or how you can take better pictures next time or something like that. Um, and there's a lot of really good identifiers. Actually one of the, I think the top identifier for all of iNaturalist is a man named John Plischke who lives in Western PA and he identifies all of the mushrooms in Philadelphia. And also Alan Rockefeller is a very wonderful, nice mycologist who has started volunteering to identify all of the mushrooms on iNaturalist for the Philly Myco Club because he's very nice and he likes us. So Mushroom Observer is really similar to um, iNaturalist. It's actually been around a lot longer, um, but it's only for mushrooms. Oh, I, I'm sorry, I should have said that about iNaturalist. iNaturalist is for any type of life. So there's trees, plants, bugs, you know, anything that you might find can go on iNaturalist. Mushroom Observer is just for mushrooms. So um, it's been around for a long time. It's a really good website. They don't have an app, so I think it's a little less user friendly. Um, but for me, particularly what I use Mushroom Observer for and what I find it to be very, very useful for is looking up pictures of a certain species. Um, so for instance, if you type Copernus comatus into Google, you absolutely cannot be sure that all of the images that are gonna show up are going to be that. Or even if they do claim to be that, you can't be sure they're going to be correctly identified as that. Um, even just on Wikipedia, sometimes they have the wrong picture, it's the, not the right mushroom. So often if I am trying to get a better idea of what a certain mushroom looks like, I will go onto Mushroom Observer and put the name in and then just Google a few different pages of observations because they have really good pictures there. Um, and because everybody here is more specifically focused on mushrooms, I find that the pictures here are a little better than iNaturalist. Um, but I prefer to upload to iNaturalist just because I think the app makes it a lot easier. Um, but if I find anything really cool, I'll put it on both because the mushroom people demand it. Um, 
so I use this one a lot when I'm trying to get a better idea of what a certain mushroom looks like. Um, because mushrooms grow and change really quickly, uh, it's really hard to just look at one picture in, in your guidebook and then get an idea of what this mushroom might look like at any given time, because mushrooms don't always look like the guidebook. So as you can see here, this would be a young version of this mushroom. This would be about a middle-aged version of this mushroom, and this is when it's older. So if you have a picture like this in your book and you find this mushroom, you might look at it and think, well, obviously that's not that mushroom, and that's not the case. So um, I think that Mushroom Observer is a great way to just scroll through a list of pictures that have all been determined to definitely be that mushroom, and they give you a better idea of how broad your uh, species idea for that species needs to be and what it might look like when it's young or what it might look like when it's old and things like that. What it might look like in different areas or different conditions because mushrooms change a lot depending on their conditions. Um, and mushrooms have a lot of different, um, basically they get messed up a lot. <laughs> they morph a lot because the only thing that a mushroom needs to do is release its spores. So if a mushroom ends up looking really nothing like it was supposed to, but it still releases its spores, it won't matter and it'll pass it on to the next generation. So um, while you don't usually run into, say, a deer that has five legs and two heads, it's really normal, really, really, really normal to run into a mushroom that doesn't look anything like what that particular mushroom is supposed to look like. You know, and it's really, um, sometimes hard to figure out what the few characteristics are that will always stay the same for each mushroom species. So that's sort of the fun of it, to figure out how they change over time and what they can look like and how weird they can be sometimes. They can be really weird. Um, here are a few other resources for you. Um, mushroomexpert.com is kind of like the Wikipedia for mushrooms. Um, by which I mean you should not use Wikipedia, the actual Wikipedia for mushrooms. It's very bad. Um, just don't do it. Don't ever expect that Wikipedia is right about mushrooms. Um, MushroomExpert.com is a wonderful website run by a guy named Michael Quo, and he does a really good job. And he's a North American based guy, so most of the mushrooms that he has are North American. Um, he has a lot of good information there. It's not always up to date, but uh, he tries to keep it up to date. Um, a lot of Facebook groups. There's hundreds and hundreds. There's so many Facebook groups about mushrooms. There's too many, honestly, way too many. But a few of them are really useful, and I would suggest that you join them if you're really interested in learning a lot about mushrooms. There's about a million for identification. The two main ones that I use are just called mushroom identification and fungus identification. Pretty straightforward. Um, if you're interested in cultivating at all. Um, I'm not a cultivator. I don't know anything about cultivating. I like to go on a scavenger hunt. Like the dog. <laughs> I like to go on a scavenger hunt. I don't like to grow things. Um, but a lot of people come, come to the Philadelphia Mycology Club because they're interested in uh, cultivating things. And that's really cool. So if you join that group, they will teach you everything you've ever wanted to know, or you can look in the posts that they've had in the, back, in the past. Um, the mushroom discussion group, if you have any weird questions that you're like, who would know the answer to this weird question? These people definitely know it. You can always post in the Philadelphia Mycology Club to ask, but there's a lot less of us. We're not as smart as some of these people. If I just have a weird question like, man, does anybody know if blah, 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 I just post it there and 10 people know the answer. Um, mushroom Time Lapse is a group that I actually made last year, personally, um, specifically to combat the problem of identification versus aging mushrooms. Um, so a lot of people will find a mushroom that they could have otherwise normally identified, but they didn't know that it looked like this when it you know, just started growing or something like that. Or they didn't know it looked like this after a few weeks of decaying. So mushroom time lapse is just a group where we try to stock the same mushroom over time and show you what it looks like when it's just starting and when it's fresh and when it's past prime so you can get a better idea of what you're finding when you're not finding textbook looking mushrooms. Um, there is no better resource than just other people to teach you. I've learned everything that I know about mushrooms from other people. I've learned very little of it from books or anything like that. Um, whether it's people on the internet or people 
in these groups IRL, um, other people are going to help you the most because they have already learned all these things and understood where they went wrong, understood what they didn't understand before. Um, so I would strongly suggest that you join a local mushroom group, even if it's not one of these two groups. There's some all over the United States and the world. Um, obviously, the Philadelphia Mycology Club is the name of the club here. We have a Facebook group that is where we're most active. Uh, we also have an Instagram for people who don't use Facebook. Um, we do have a mailing list that we're trying to get more active with, but we currently are not using that too much. Um, the New Jersey Mycological Association is a fantastic club that has been around since maybe the early 80s. Um, they are a much more real club than my club. Uh, they have all kinds of really cool, knowledgeable people, really cool resources. They have like libraries that you can loan out. They have all kinds of events all year round. They get speakers from all over the world. They're very cool. It costs $10 to be in their club for the whole year. And then they usually give you a present at the end of the year. I got a mug last year, it was great. So I cannot overstate how much I love that club and how much you will learn if you join that club and how nice everybody is in that club. Um, last but not least, Learn Your Land. A uh, really nice guy named Adam Harrington. He lives in Western PA, so he's very close to us. So all of his videos are really um, like useful for us compared to most people around the country. Um, and he's really one of the only YouTube channels that teaches you a lot of really good information about mushrooms. It's always really science-based. It's always really uh, well-resourced. Um, he does a really, a lot of really good videos. I would specifically say that you should check out, um, if you're just getting started, he has a video that's, I think, nine springtime mushrooms to hunt in PA or something like that. And they're all the, all the basic mushrooms like morels and oysters and things that you might want to know and how you identify them and where you would look for them. Um, he's done a really good job with some of those videos. They're not too long. They're not boring or anything like that. Um, I would definitely check him out. He's one of the only people that I really learned from or, or watched in sort of a, a class sort of way when I first got into this. And I think he does a great job. Um, so these are the three books that I would recommend for anybody looking to buy field guides in this area. This one is the smallest. I think it might have the least amount of species, but if you're looking for something small that you can always carry around, this is a good one. The guy who wrote it is a really wonderful, nice man. Um, this is the, I think the biggest one and probably my favorite one. Um, but I think both of these two, they're pretty similar and they're both real good. I like all three of these. I use all three of these when I'm showing them to people. They're all real pretty, and real nice. Um, uh, let's see. I think that is all that I have to say. Thank you guys for letting me talk to you about mushrooms. I love talking about mushrooms. I just want more people to hunt mushrooms with, honestly. It's just, it's just what I like to do. Thank you so much, Bethany. I hope I'm not making weird sounds again here. No, no, you sound good now, actually. Oh, and fabulous. You have a dog I think I now. putting my finger over something. Yeah. Um, are you good if anyone has questions? Yeah, I would love to answer questions. Um, I don't know. You can either unmute yourself or you can just put it in the chat box. Hello. Are there, oh, are there chat boxes? I wasn't paying attention to the chat box the whole time. No, My bad. I found it now. <laughs> okay. Does anyone have a question? Yes, I do. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Uh, so have you used the app Google Lens? I, uh, I haven't like personally used it. I've seen other people using it. Um, it works pretty well. I would say it works about as well as iNaturalist. Um, the only difference being that then iNaturalist, if it was wrong, someone will then log in and tell you that it was wrong. Right. Um, but it works, it works pretty well compared to when I first got into this, I downloaded a couple apps that were like Mushroom ID app, and they're all very bad. <laughs> like, I don't know, they're really bad. Um, so I would say that the best, the best I identification apps would maybe be like Google Lens, if not iNaturalist, but I would probably just use iNaturalist because yeah, 
sounds like the community there is a lot more robust and, and specialized. I was just curious. Exactly. Yeah, it has about the same ability as Google Lens, but then um, it has the added benefit of sort of a safety net of other people. If because sometimes you're going to get it wrong, like, like sometimes yeah. you just always will pick the wrong thing, and somebody will be like, "Oh, now it looks like that, but it's not that," you know. Gotcha. Thank you. No problem. Uh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, so, um, obviously, my, my search for morals uh, is going to probably consume me since I have the free time. Good. Uh, and this is the time this month and everything else. But probably my biggest concern is stepping on them rather than discovering them. Yeah. Uh, unlike the other ones. Um, any tips as far as trying to uh, locate them? Uh, is there a specific time of the day that's best to look for them? Or is it just like, uh, you know, hit or miss? Okay, um, as far as stepping on them, one of, the, one of the most important things I would tell people uh, if they're having trouble finding mushrooms is slow down. That's like the biggest thing is that people don't realize that they're walking way too fast. Um, a lot of mushrooms are smaller than you think they are or they're gonna look smaller than you think they're going to look from where you're at. Um, definitely just slowing down a lot. So, um, you know, I'll walk, at a reasonable pace when I'm on when I'm on the trail, but especially if I'm walking around in like a grassy area where I think they might be popping up, I'm really not even walking. I'm stepping and then I'm looking around and I'll step and I'll look around. Um, but I think looking for the right types of trees and things is an important um, part of that. We have been finding them a lot this year with um, apple trees and cherry trees. They're known around here for uh, growing with tulip poplar but we've had a lot of a lot of success finding them near apple trees recently. Um, and if you don't know what those trees look like, you can again go on iNaturalist and search apple tree and um, try and find where some of those are and things like that. And what you want to do is find an area where you think they might be, and basically just stand there and look much slower. Um, so. Yeah, a lot of the times uh, a south facing slope is something that people like to say is they find morels on a south facing slope because it'll be uh, the soil is a bit warmer there for them. Um, it definitely is a matter of luck. It's definitely just a matter of, <laughs> of learning how to spot them. Um, a lot of mushrooms are hard to see until somebody's pointed them out to you. Like I was standing in a bunch of black trumpets until somebody was like, look, black trumpets. And I was like, what are you talking about? And then he pointed at one and then I could see all of them, you know, because your brain just doesn't normally look at these things. We're normally just deaf to it. Um, I would definitely say just slow down and keep looking. There's no time of day. That's um, not really a thing. Uh, definitely right after the rain. So right now it's been not as rainy. I would say that last week there was a lot more than there would be this week, but I definitely think that you have plenty of weeks left and you should definitely be able to find them. Um, well, how many uh, typically you said like two or three days or like immediately one day after rain? Well, so it depends on how early it rained before that. Does that make sense? Um, yeah. So if, if it's been completely dry and then it rains a little, they're probably not going to pop up the next day, you know? But if it's been raining and then there's a little more rain, I'd just go out the day after it rained. But it really just, it depends um, mm -hmm. on, on, on how wet the soil is going to be and how wet it's going to stay and things like that. Um, I would definitely try and find areas with tulip poplars and apple trees and cherry trees. Um, I would stand under those trees and slowly look around. Sometimes I even crouch down to try and get a better better viewpoint. Um, and I would just look where I step before I step. That's what I often do. Literally, I'll just look and I'll be like, okay, my foot's oh, yeah. safe to go there. You know, sometimes I just find them when I'm ducking under a tree. I'm like, oh, Morel, there's one. Okay. So if you just Put in a lot of time it, you'll you'll do it and then it'll get easier the more you find them the more you'll get an idea of where they are and it starts to become more of a sense of like you see an area and you're like oh i bet a bunch of morels grow there it looks like they do you know besides the more besides the morels any other things uh mushrooms that we should be on the lookout um that are uh hopefully common for philadelphia area right now this time of the month right now um well I wasn't going to go into it, but if you're interested in Slossaby, they are popping. They're, okay. they're happening right now. They're called Ovoids. You can Google it. O-V-O-I-D-S. 
I won't go into it much more than that, but they're growing. Um, their chicken of the woods is starting to grow. Just a few people have found that. I'm really excited. I want to find some. There's been some really nice ones coming up. Um, right now, honestly, early spring and the middle of spring is, is not a great time for mushrooms except morels. Um, but late in the spring, it's gonna start being a lot more diversity. And in the summer, there'll just be a thousand more species to be seeing. Um, so right now I would definitely say like morels and um, not, there's not a lot of other good edible species right now, but if you keep looking, they'll, they'll show up. Um, somebody asked any rules of thumb to quickly identify poisonous mushrooms? No, mm -mm, that's not a thing. There's no, um, you just have to know what they are. Luckily, there's not very many poisonous mushrooms in Philadelphia. There's very few of them. Um, so you should just learn the ones that can kill you because there's not many of them. There's like, I don't, I don't know how many, maybe like in the world or yeah, I think maybe there's like three in Philly that I've ever seen that could actually kill you. Um, and other than that, a lot of them would just make you sick to your stomach. So if you learn the ones that can kill you, um, then, you know, you can be a lot less worried about that, but really there's no rule of thumb at all. You just have to, to know what they are. So a lot of the ones that can kill you are in the, the, the genus Amanita that we were talking about before with that vulva and the little skirt around the, the stem. Um, so a lot of people just won't go near that genus because uh, a lot of the deadly ones can be in that genus, but not everything in that genus is deadly. So, um, so there's also Gallerina marginata, which is a small brown mushroom that um, would be deadly, but it's pretty small. Uh, a lot of people don't even notice it or want to eat it, so that's luckily pretty safe. Um, there's very few mushrooms that can hurt you. Overall, uh, most mushrooms are not going to even make you sick to your stomach or anything like that. Um, there's a lot more mushrooms that you can eat than you can't eat, I would say. Most of them are going to just not taste good. There are a lot of mushrooms that you don't want to eat simply because they're not good and they're hard or whatever, um, but there's not that many that would, that would really seriously injure you. And as long as you don't swallow them without knowing what it is for sure, you cannot be hurt. <laughs> um, and I would just always get a second opinion if you're ever not completely, completely sure. It never hurts to just post it online and say, hey guys, I think this is this thing. Then you can get 15 people who are all like, yep, it's that thing, and then you don't have to worry about it. You know? There's a question in the chat. Well, there's two questions in the chat. Um, one of them is, what's going to happen if there's a frost? If there's already mushrooms out, will they just die? Or mm, yeah. So sometimes, if there's a frost, the mushrooms will uh, abort, which is what we call it, where they started growing and then they didn't reach maturity, but they just decided they were going to bail, and then they'll just stop. You know. So sometimes that happens. Sometimes they won't because um, a lot of the mushrooms that are growing right now are still like cold weather, happy mushrooms. Um, it, it's definitely possible that some of them will just get all messed up, but since it's for one day, I don't think it'll be too much of a problem, honestly. I don't think it'll be, like, especially like if a grown morel just freezes for the night, it'll still be there the next day. You can still find it. It'll be fine. <laughs> I don't think it'll be too much of an issue. Um, uh, oh, sorry. The no other question. Oh yeah, what was it? The other question was, what is your favorite species of mushroom and why? Oh my god, any species that I've never seen before is my favorite species of mushroom. Um, that's a cliche answer, but it's true. I, I'm here for the diversity. Um, a lot of people get into mushrooms for different reasons. A lot of people are into like eating mushrooms, so they get into mushrooms for foraging, and then their favorite will be like whatever the, the tastiest one is or something. I honestly don't even eat mushrooms. Like I don't not eat mushrooms, but I don't cook. So I don't really forage that much for mushrooms. Um, so the edibility is not really uh, much of a thing to me, but I like to find new mushrooms that I've never seen before and learn about them and learn their names and things like that. So um, I, I really like anything that I've never found before. I also have a few favorites. There's one called Schizophyllum commune, 
that's a really common mushroom. Uh, commune is why the, the epithet is commune is because it's very common. You can find it pretty much all over the world. I think it's in just about every country. Um, it has a few weird facts about it that I like to tell people. So that's one of the reasons it's my favorite other than being really cute. Um, it has 23,000 sexual mating types. Uh, so like sexes, so like how, you know, we could all argue about this, but in general, people it usually fall into the sex of male or female for humans, and they have 23,000 different sexual mating types. So that is really, I don't even understand what that means, but I know it's true. <laughs> um, and they also are a human pathogen. Schizophilum commune is a human pathogen. Most fungi cannot infect people because our body temperature is too high for them, um, which is why when it's really, really hot out, you won't see a lot of mushrooms because they can't really survive when it's too hot. Um, but that's one of the few fungi that could feasibly uh, live in your body. And it's not a very common thing to get. You would have to be way too exposed to it and having some immunocompromised issues. Um, but people have gotten it before. Um, so that's a really interesting one can't think of any other specific favorites. I don't know. It's really hard. I love so many of them. I don't know. Uh, There's one more question in the chat. I'm going to have to read it because it was long. It says, I have mushrooms roughly the size of a quarter and brownish. They grow on twigs of oak trees and look like chewy wood ears in Chinese hot and sour soup. Any chance these could be edible? They very much might be chewy wood ears from Chinese hot and sour soup. <laughs> They're probably that. Um, I mean, don't eat it based off me saying that because obviously I didn't see a picture of it. But um, wood ears or auricularia species um, grow all over Philadelphia. They're really, really, really common around here. Pretty much anytime it rains, even all through the winter, you can find wood ear mushrooms. Um, or there will be other different jelly type fungus called exidia. Those are all um, also edible. So it, it definitely might just be wood ears. You could just find wood ears in your yard or something like that and you could eat them. Um, it's the same exact type as the type that you find at the Asian food markets. That's actually a fun thing to do at the Asian food markets. You can go and find like eight different types of different mushroom species. Um, whereas if you go to American grocery stores, they have usually one type of mushroom species that is called multiple things. So cremini, button mushroom, uh, portobello, those are all the exact same type of mushroom. Those are all Agaricus bisphorus that are just called different things. <laughs> Fun fact. Any other questions? Is there a regular meetup group that uh, goes hunting for mushrooms? Yeah, so um, if you haven't yet, you should join the Facebook group, Philadelphia Mycology Club. Um, we post all of our hikes and stuff there. Obviously, we're not really having group hikes right now, um, which is really sad because last year we were having them pretty much every week when it was nice out. We go out all the time because we are nerds and we like to hang out with each other. Um, even in the winter, we have like some get togethers. We even do some, some hunting in the winter and stuff. You can still find some stuff. It's just weirder stuff. Um, so we go out at least, at least every other week, normally, when there's not, you know, pestilence among us. So <laughs> if you stay tuned, I promise we will. Um, you could also request a socially distanced hike with my friend Sam and I, Sam of my video name. Um, we are still doing some very small, like under five people, socially distanced hikes for anyone looking for some like tutoring who really really wants to get out there and get some help and don't know what they're doing because we go out every day anyway so we can just go out with you and just stay away <laughs> so that's always an option you can message us anybody else sounds, sounds like you're a risk taker for mushrooms i i only take a few <laughs> risks i'll put on a mask <laughs> i have stopped going to the main um like I, like I usually, you know, a normal year would go to Valley Green Inn a lot. And now I'm like, well, I can't go there because it's busier than the county fair now. So I, I try to go to like the trailheads that are less popping these days. It's not too hard to stay 
stay far away. Anybody else? Can talk all day. Oh, I can't hear you, Lizzie, if you're talking. Did you say something? Whew, sorry. Hi, there you are. No, I, I pressed something about editing. I don't know. Um, sorry, I just wanted to say thank you so much. And hopefully no sometime soon, although we wouldn't have been able to have this many people in the actual library because we only have 40 chairs. Um, <laughs> but hopefully sometime soon we'll be able to maybe have you back and maybe you can um, go on a hike with people or something like that. that I would, would love really to awesome. do that. Yeah, but, definitely. But yeah, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. No and I think problem. everyone had a great time. <laughs> Thanks for being here, guys. Join the club. Thanks Stay a lot. in touch. Thank you. Great. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye, Beth. Thanks. You're welcome.